Good Mental Health. I'm your host, Matt Kelly. I'm pleased to be joined, as always, by my co-host, our behavior expert and solutions-focused life coach out of Woodstock, Vermont, Dr. Neil Marinello. Neil, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome. My pleasure also, Matt. The show, of course, is Good Mental Health. Our objective here is for listeners to uh, take what they can and what they want from uh, each of these uh, podcast series uh, shows in the series that we are doing. The uh, series is based on uh, tweets that Dr. Neil Marinello himself has published on his Twitter feed. You can follow him directly at Coach Dr. Neil. Our topic for this week is no one is better than anyone else. And Neil, I have to tell you, as the curator of the topics here, you know, we're basically kind of doing what I like to consider the 12 tweets for life uh, based on Dr. Neil, if you will. So these are sort of our foundational ones before we move into it much more uh, deeper as the uh, series progresses. And certainly, uh, as I have the opportunity to curate and decide what each topic we're going to uh, speak about. I've had an opportunity to really sit with this and find my response to it in different levels. And certainly on an intellectual level, I can understand it. And on an emotional level, uh, you know, as my soul would speak. But I, I still find that I'm having some difficulty with it. And I think I found where that that is originating in. And that is in my ego or the ego, the egoic mind, as you and I have spoken about before, as I refer to it, that it wants to basically think I am less than everybody else. Mm. Well, a lot of people want to think they're less than, and a lot of people want to think they're more than. Uh, the truth, as I see it, is that uh, uh, that in each of us is a specialist in one or more areas. Uh, I don't consider myself to be better than anyone else, uh, except in one or two areas. Uh, I'm pretty good at talking to people. I'm pretty good at helping people change for the better. Uh, if you ask me to, uh, to figure out how to get uh, uh, a chair through a door, uh, I'm an idiot. Uh, I literally can't, uh, uh, can't operate as a mechanical engineer in any sense. If I'm an engineer of any kind, I'm a thought engineer. Uh, but the bottom line on it is that, uh, that uh, no matter uh, what you, your particular area of specialty is, each person does have an area of specialty. And it doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how powerful you are. It doesn't matter how rich you are. You know, those are ways that people compare themselves to other people. Uh, but the real comparison that matters is comparing to yourself. Each of us uh, can be better than we are. And uh, if I'm good at anything, it's uh, helping people to figure out how they can be better than they are right now. Mm. Uh, but uh, I have been um, fooled by, uh, by people who uh, were uh, on an, uh, an intelligence test uh, 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 would, categorize, would be categorized as uh, mentally challenged. Uh, I have been conned. Uh, I, I remember one time, um, well, uh, I trained as a clinical psychologist, and the tool of the psychologist is the, uh, the test. Uh, the tool of the psychiatrist is uh, the medicine. And uh, 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 unfortunately, social workers and coaches are stuck with just having to talk to people. Hmm. Uh, the reality is that uh, in one way or another, I've either administered or overseen probably over a thousand IQ tests and other types of tests that uh, uh, that I've given or other psychologists have given. Uh, at the same time, um, I remember uh, interviewing a teenage boy, talking to him for about uh, 15 minutes. And uh, before I administered the uh, IQ test, the Wexler Intelligence Scale uh, uh, revised to him, uh, if I had been asked, what do you think his IQ is? I would have said about average. And uh, his IQ turned out to be 62. Hmm. Uh, and as I thought about it afterwards, I realized that uh, he had really practiced how to look cool, how to look like a teenager, how to sneer like a teenager, how to act as if uh, uh, he, he was dismissing everything that I said, when in fact he wasn't understanding anything that I said. 
I got conned by someone who was uh, by any intelligence test uh, uh, in the bottom 1%. Hmm. Wow. Well, you know, as I keep in mind, again, the, the topic, no one is better than anyone else. One of the things that uh, kept coming to mind for me was uh, two of our richest uh, men, if you will, in uh, the American culture today, uh, Jeff Bezos and, and Bill Gates, both going through uh, the breakdown in their primary relationship with their spouses and going through divorces. So it doesn't matter uh, how much money you make, um, you know, a breakdown in a primary relationship uh, transcends uh, all of us. Um, uh, so uh, that was one of the things that just kept coming up to me that here our society certainly is idolizing uh, these rich people um, and yet they're no better than the average person at a human relationship. Uh, well, when I moved to uh, Woodstock, Vermont, I was scared. My specialty was always working with poor people. Mm. Uh, Woodstock, Vermont has one of the largest percentages of uh, uh, multimillionaires of any small town. There's only 4,000 people in this town. At the same time, a huge percentage of them are multimillionaires. Uh, this is where uh, Lawrence Rockefeller uh, set up uh, uh, stakes. And, uh, uh, and one of the things that frightened me was I didn't know that I, I knew how to work with rich people and I had never been rich. Uh, when I got here, I realized something that I uh, hadn't even considered, which is that uh, uh, rich people are just uh, like the rest of us, uh, only they don't have the excuse the rest of us have. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, uh, I remember coming into town and seeing uh, the person that I assumed must be the village idiot, uh, because I could see his overall uh, uh, legs sticking out of a trash bin. Uh, as he was digging into it. And it turned out he was the richest man in town. Mm. Uh, his name was Frank Teagle. He was very much of a, uh, uh, a conservationist and a recycling person. Uh, uh, at the same time, um, and he had, he had a three page portfolio, one line of which was 20,000 shares of Exxon. Uh, at the same time, uh, Frank was just a very normal guy in most respects. Uh, uh, I remember him walking out of the Woodstock Inn one time, reaching into his pocket, pulling out a, uh, uh, a, a used uh, piece of soap and saying, uh, can you believe it, Neil? Uh, I can get six showers out of this soap. They were going to throw it out. Mm. Uh, uh, the man was, uh, uh, was extraordinary in many respects, uh, but he had no real sense of, uh, of reality. Uh, uh, at one point, uh, his, uh, his lawyer was uh, my best friend at the time, Gary Brown, uh, and uh, Gary called me up one time and said, uh, uh, Neil, uh, tell me what to do. Uh, uh, Frank de decided that uh, it would make sense for, um, uh, for him to make, play a joke on a friend of his who got picked up in a, new, in a uh, no nuke rally, and the friend had, uh, uh, had been put in jail. And Frank thought it'd be a, a really great joke to send him a cake with a file in it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, it was that sort of, you know, unreal unreality, you know, mm. that, uh, that, uh, that some rich people uh, have. Mm. Uh, dealing with, with, with people who have money, what you begin to realize is that rules get set up about how to use the money. And those rules get set up by people whose specialty is supposed to be managing money. So sometimes it's bankers, sometimes it's, uh, it's uh, financial managers, uh, but those rules vary and, and sometimes they're good and sometimes they're not. Mm. Uh, so being rich by itself uh, uh, doesn't really make a huge amount of difference in how you can manage yourself uh, uh, emotionally, manage your relationships, mm. the relationships to work. Money doesn't have much to do with it. Mm. Relationships to work, uh, four things have to be happening. Both people have to want it to work. The good times have to outweigh the bad times. And on that one, one really bad time can outweigh a lot, maybe even all the good times. Each person has to feel like they have a good deal. 
Each person has to feel like the other is doing the best they can. Those are all attitude things. Those are all state of mind things. Mm. Have nothing to do with money. Right, right. But, uh, you know, going back to our subject, you know, no one is better than anybody else. Um, it seems that we're in a paradigm in our society that seems to value uh, a Bill Gates or a or an Elon Musk, as an example, um, yeah. more so than than others. And actually, um, to to come at it even with animosity, um, you know, there was uh, Elon Musk just appeared on Saturday Night Live, and and there was some backlash uh, yeah. that someone worth so much money should you know, uh, be involved in, in the production or, or something like that. And so again, I find it interesting as to the animosity that perhaps some people might feel uh, against those who are more successful or who have been luckier than they have and how it's displayed in terms of money or, or other uh, realms that we may say uh, or, or we may value more in our society. And, and speaking to myself, you know, going back to, again, my original premise, that, again, is the tool of the ego to compare myself against someone and to see where I, uh, I fall short uh, as a way to, A, either spur me on to, to achieve more or as a, a manipulative a, manip a manipulative tool of the ego to try to keep me down. Yeah, I think that uh, there are all kinds of ways that people use uh, to think themselves into being inferior. Mm. Uh, and there are ways people use to think themselves into being superior. Uh, the idea that, uh, that money is the, uh, mm. is the way of determining whether you're uh, better than someone else or worse than someone else, uh, uh, the reality is that uh, whether it's money, whether it's power, whether it's anything else, nobody gets out of life alive. <laughs> nobody gets to take it with them. And, uh, and those people who uh, believe that money is anything other than a tool to get you from one situation to another uh, are uh, delusional. Uh, you know, the, the reality is that you need a certain amount in order to survive. Uh, beyond that, um, uh, you're playing games uh, with, uh, you know, he who dies with the most toys wins. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it doesn't matter. The quality mm -hmm. of life is what it's about. Mm -hmm. Happiness and is knowing you're growing. Happiness well, is knowing you have your act more together now than you did uh, a month ago and knowing you'll have your act more together a month from now than you do now. And has nothing to do with how much money you have in your pocket, unless you're homeless, <laughs> unless you're really hurting. And, and uh, those people need help. And they need help from people who are less hurting. Mm. And this, you know, I love uh, our progression of our series of conversations here because, um, you know, we started with I'm the most important person in the world to me. And yet here we come back around to no one is more important or no one is better than anybody else. Um, so that's a rather interesting paradigm at the same time uh, that here we are res wrestling, wrestling with that. Um, yeah, I, I am the most important that. person, and yet yeah. uh, no one is better than anyone else. Yeah, I don't see much contradiction there. You know, I think uh, uh, since uh, since I'm the most important person in the world to me, I can improve myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, and if I'm good at anything, it's uh, helping people to figure out how they can be better. Mm -hmm. uh, but the bottom line on it is. Uh, uh, it, so what, you know, so what I'm good at it and certainly in, in, uh, is something that uh, uh, that you may not be that good at what you're mm. good at, you know, I mean, look at look at this relationship, you and me at this point, I have no idea, you know, you before this started, you, you were showing me how to use this computer and how right. to uh, set up the microphone. I don't know anything about that, you know, right. I'm, I'm just good at talking to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it, it's interesting because I feel it comes back around to the shame issue again, that if, you know, if I it goes back to, you know, what I was saying earlier that, you know, it's the egoic mind in me that 
makes me want to compare myself to someone. And usually the ego wants to then try to keep me down by bringing up shame, which again is a topic that we talked about here in our last episode and our probably our last two episodes. So I'm enjoying the connection, if you will, of these topics. And again, believing that it's the foundation, uh, as we say, to good mental health, to try to significate, which we've also talked about, uh, this, this concept. No one is better than anyone else. Yeah, yeah. And I think that there are a variety of ways in which shame fits in. Uh, you know, if we just look at the issue of bullying, for example, mm. uh, that's, uh, you know, the, the name of the game is uh, I'm, I'm better than you because I'm stronger than you because I can make you say uncle. Uh, when the reality is that, uh, uh, that power uh, uh, is one of the worst ways of establishing superiority. Uh, the, uh, uh, the best way has more to do with love, has more to do with uh, wanting what's best for that person, even if it's not what's best for you, mm. That's my definition of love. So when you get hung up in the negative side of it and the shame thing and in the bullying thing and in the, uh, oh, I, uh, I let my mother down because uh, uh, she didn't, uh, uh, because she gave me the bottle instead of uh, changing my diaper. Uh, it, it's all this, uh, what you refer to as the ego thing. It's, it's basically the ego is forming based on the reactions of other people. And the reactions of other people are basically things that you're seeing uh, and, and assuming has to do with you. Uh, it may have something to do with how you behaved, but it doesn't have to do with, oh, uh, I'm wrong because this person is big, who's bigger and stronger and whom I depend on uh, has an expression on their face that uh, doesn't give me what I need. Mm. Well, and, and to bring that back around again with um, uh, uh, that we all live in our own reality, uh, which was our, our last uh, topic of discussion, in that if somebody doesn't come to my way of thinking, they're either right or wrong. Um, so if they don't come to my reality, uh, they're either right or wrong. And then that can, um, you know, perpetuate a sense of superiority of I am better than that person or they are uh, lesser than me. And, um, you know, and I think we see this a lot in our current society of uh, people on both sides of the political spectrum looking at the other and saying, I'm right, you're wrong, therefore I'm better than you are. And the bottom line on that one is that uh, uh, if, I'm, if I'm better than, than most people at one thing, it's uh, getting inside other people's heads. Sure. Uh, if I can't get inside your head, you're better than I am. Mm. You know, my job is to understand how you think. <laughs> And if, uh, if with whatever skill set I've developed over the last 60 years, I don't understand how you think, then uh, you know, uh, I need to go to work here. I'm not doing my job right. Mm. Uh, so the reality is that when you say I'm right or wrong, what you're really doing is avoiding the fact that you're not inside the other person's head. You're not thinking the way they think. You're not actually understanding that in their minds, they're right. And, uh, and you have to really understand how the minds work. And I say minds because, as we've talked about before, there are at least two. There's the conscious and the subconscious. Okay, right. But would you, you know, and we're going to digress here a little bit. I would almost say that there are three. And we've just touched on it. The third is the egoic mind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. If they're talking about uh, the, the way in which we think about ourselves, uh, some call it the announcer inside our heads. You know, some people walk around, you know, really believing that uh, uh, and, and thinking to themselves, describing themselves and what they're doing and describing other people and what they're doing uh, as if it's all objective outside of themselves. Mm. Uh, the, uh, the truth is that we all have a way of thinking. And I see that way of thinking as being very similar to what you're describing as the egoic mind. Uh, that particular way of thinking is, in my mind, something that can be changed. And it can be changed, especially if I understand how you're thinking. Uh, if I understand how you're thinking, then I'm there. And I can say something that gives you a way of looking at your thinking that changes it 
And then it's up to you whether you want to change it or not. I, I love actually what you've just said for the simple reason that, you know, I'm of the belief that, you know, the history of man, if you would say, is really the history of the egoic mind. Mm -hmm. um, and the egoic mind is bent on you not seeing the other point of view you know, and getting offended uh, over words, let's say. And then, of course, that is, you know, perpetuated war and, 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 and so on and so forth. And, you know, the subjugation of, of humans and the human spirit. Um, and that's the, the egoic mind. But what you've just said is, is, I think, the crux here is being able to step into the other person's point of view and adopt it as your own and advocate for it as your own because that's that's the only place that it seems like empathy can really uh, spring from. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I think if, if you want to go back to, I'm a reductionist as I've said before, if you want to mm -hmm. go back to the basics here, it's Descartes, you know, I think therefore I am. So understanding how you think is what allows me to be able to change that or to give you a way, another way of thinking that might change it. And if I can't understand the way you think, uh, I'm not doing my job. Mm -hmm. And that's good advice for, I think, us out here in the general public as well. Um, um, and, yeah. and it's interesting because, you know, one of the uh, future uh, topics of our, of our podcast series here is, is another one of your famous tweets, which I just love. And that is, you know, the definition of compromise is that both of us don't get what we want. Um, and that can only uh, occur again, I think, uh, based on what we've been discussing just now with that empathy and stepping into the other's shoes to uh, hear that point of view. Yeah, flexibility instead of cancel culture. Right, there it is. We're speaking with uh, Dr. Neil Marinello. Our series topic is Good Mental Health. It's based on his series of tweets. You can always follow him on Twitter, at Coach Dr. Neil. Our subject here today is no one is better than anyone else. It follows up on our other three topics that we've uh, been speaking with, that uh, I am the most important person in the world to me. Um, uh, we each live in our own reality. Uh, and here again, no one is better than anyone else. Uh, Dr. Neil, do you want to offer some final thoughts on that, that uh, statement and how, you know, our viewing public might be able to optimize it going forward as they go out into the world uh, and to use it to uh, get to good mental health? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that the, uh, uh, the, the way that I started to, to play around with this was uh, really when I was uh, a, uh, a freshman at Harvard. And uh, as we've said before, I was very young. And, uh, and if no one else knew it, I knew I was stupid. I knew there was all kinds of things I didn't understand about the world. Uh, I also was interested in this field. And uh, so one of the first jobs I got was working uh, in a mental hospital at Mass Massachusetts Mental. And uh, uh, while I was there, of course, I was working at the lowest level as a psychiatric aide. Uh, I think I was making a dollar ten an hour, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that was 1961. Uh, and uh, they had a thing they at that point they called specialing, which is they put one person, uh, one psychiatric aide, with one particularly difficult uh, patient. Uh, while I was there, a sophomore at Harvard was admitted as a patient. Uh, and uh, he was uh, uh, very interesting to all of the psychiatrists and psychologists and other mental health professionals there uh, because this was the era of Freud and he had actually had sex with his mother. Mm. There were plenty of gals that had had sex with their fathers, but very few, in fact, he was the only one that they had seen who had had sex with their mother. Uh, and. Uh, so all of a sudden, I, uh, a 16 year old uh, 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 kid, uh, was getting all kinds of attention because the only person that this guy would talk to was me. 
And the reason he would talk to me was he was a sophomore at Harvard. I was a freshman at Harvard. He was telling me things like, uh, you know, hey, don't take this course, take that course. This guy's a good teacher, blah, blah, blah. We were playing cards a lot. Meantime, uh, the head psychiatrist there was saying to me, will you ask him this? Will you ask him that? You know, what was it like when he was? And, uh, and I was feeling, you know, totally confused. And at the same time realizing, you know, this field, this mental health field, uh, the top people in the field are, are getting down on their knees to me. All of a sudden, I'm some very important person uh, when I know I'm stupid. <laughs> I know I don't know what I'm doing. And I know that the, the only reason this guy's talking to me is because we go to the same school. Uh, it began the concept that we're 60 years later talking about now. Uh, the, the idea that no one's better than anyone else. Uh, I was better than all of these psychiatrists and psychologists and all these people who had all these uh, letters after their name. And the reason was because uh, uh, I could talk to somebody they couldn't talk to in moment. Mm. Mm. And it, it's interesting that you bring this up because I this had been going around in my head as well in preparation for our discussion um, in that uh, you as a 15, 16 year old uh, student at Harvard, one of the youngest at the time to ever enter. Um, and the, the, the intimidation that that must have brought onto you. And in a sense, what we're talking about just now, that even, even in elite mm -hmm. colleges, among the elite of the elite, there is still that feeling that one is not as good as the other, because maybe in their class of Harvard, they're, you know, in the bottom, you know, 10% uh, or something like that, which still would be miles in a way above any one of you or I in, in the general public. Um, so that was just a really interesting, again, analogy of this concept that no one is better than anyone else. And even in the elitist of the elitist of schools, that's a hard concept for them uh, to even uh, uh, ascribe to. Well, I, I believe that uh, everybody at Harvard uh, felt like they were faking it. Mm. Everybody felt like, oh my God, there are all these other people around here. I, I know for me, uh, this concept also got underlined uh, by virtue of the fact that uh, I graduated second in the class of over 300 uh, in a public school. Uh, and uh, the top, uh, this was Mamaroneck High School in Mamaroneck, New York, a, a suburb of the city. Uh, and of the top 20 positions in the class, even though the class was 50-50 male and female, 16 of the positions were occupied by boys, uh, 14 of which uh, were uh, Jewish boys. Uh, and, uh, and, and all of those 14 applied to Harvard, and I was the only one that got in. Yeah. And from my point of view, many of those guys were better than I was. Uh, at the same time, uh, I get to Harvard, and uh, half the class of Exeter is there, half the class of, uh, uh, of Andover is there. Uh, these are the, uh, the preppies. Uh, and, and they had worse board scores than the other guys that I went to school with. And I'm looking at them and I'm saying, you know, uh, what's so great about them and what makes them better than these other guys? And why am I better than the guys that, as far as I was concerned, were better than I? Uh, so the whole concept of someone being better than someone else struck me as a, a load of crap. Right. Uh, and uh, I guess I've sort of followed up on that and, and realized that I don't think I've ever met with somebody I didn't learn something from. Mm. Uh, and it doesn't matter, you know, for, for six years, I was in charge of all of the programs for uh, developmentally disabled people in Vermont, uh, uh, you know, people who uh, uh, were emotionally and intellectually challenged uh, and, uh, and physically challenged. And at the same time, every one of them that I met with, no matter how, uh, how they scored on IQ tests or what, the, every one of them had an area, a way of thinking that taught me something. Mm. And, uh, and I feel beholden to all of them and I don't feel better than any of them. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, as we uh, wrap up here, for me, it's just a, 
uh, an opportunity to be reminded that, you know, walk in somebody's shoes. It doesn't matter who that person is. Uh, if you can take on that persona or, or uh, like we say, walk in their shoes, that notion of anyone being better or less than somebody else goes away pretty quickly. And, and if we can always try to keep that in our forefront of our minds, which is one of the messages I think of this podcast series is that uh, we, we come up with uh, some great topics that if we can always keep them in the forefront of our minds or use them as our basis for our own individual operating system, I think it will lead us to good mental health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the uh, the way I way uh, I interpret it is uh, rather than walk in someone else's shoes, think the way someone else thinks. And, uh, and one of the first awarenesses that I had when I got in this business was uh, there are no bad thoughts, there are no bad emotions, uh, there are only bad things we say and do. And uh, when you accept that then you realize that how you think really affects your emotions and your actions and uh and it's possible to change both based on changing the way you think mm. and you know what i've learned uh in in my work with you over the years is that each of us is doing the best we can with what we have uh at any given time yeah, well, if we look at this relationship, the relationship that you and I have, what we're really talking about here is uh, uh, you're very good at some things that I'm not good at at all. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you know, I use my area of specialty, you use yours, but uh, neither of us is any better than the other. Right. And we come up with uh, what I hope and what I hope our viewers uh, uh, find to be engaging content that will uh, um, give them pause for thought and introspection as they navigate uh, the challenges of life. On behalf of uh, my uh, co-host, Dr. Neil Marinello, I'm Matt Kelly, uh, wanting to thank you for joining us here today. Uh, uh, again, our topic has been no one is better than anyone else. A reminder, you can follow uh, Dr. Neil uh, on Twitter at Coach Dr. Neil, and we invite you to join us on our next podcast as we both wish you good mental health.